and the hummingbirds up here have been coming every year and they know that that huge tree is full of blooms and food probably for two and a half or three months and they will do a couple rounds of nests yeah. and so the only places they have to nest around here are in these ancient old bay trees yeah 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 that mimosa tree that's from china yeah my, my wife Allie knows that the, the, uh, uh, but if the, you the word for it it has a lot of ethno botanical history yeah to that and they place. smell wonderful but mm -hmm. have you ever seen one that big that's a big one yeah yeah that's a big one and it's still young yeah, yeah. so but you can hear they're all around and oftentimes, if I come out here in the trees, I'll look and I'll see, you know, 30, 40 of them zooming around. And, of course, then you watch the acrobats where yeah. they go up and then drop down so fast. And you know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're competing with one another, the males, to impress the females with their vitality. Sure, <laughs> sure. Have you, uh, have you counted? Do you have any sense of your I can't. local population? Who can count a hummingbird? Um. <laughs> I guess people can, but they <laughs> yeah. called ecologists or biologists. Biologists, <laughs> right. they must have secrets that I don't have because they're so busy jumping around. I've tried. I've done like I've gotten up to eight or nine or ten, and then I'm going. Did I count that one before? Because they move so quickly. Well, I, that gets to that gets to like uh, what we're doing here, which is we're sitting in one place for a year. Yeah, and we're watching it change. Right. That's that's an old uh, ecologist's experiment, really. Yeah. To draw a circle in the dirt. Just, just a three-foot circle in the dirt. Uh, 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 Haskell in uh, the Forest and Scene does this. Yes, where he, yeah. he, he just talks about like a deer moves through at yeah. some point in October, and so he spends a whole chapter talking about deer migration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we we take we take seasonal hints to uh, expound this this conversation, which is which is which is about the more than human world which is so intimately tied to the human world, as it always has been in California. Well, it's interesting it's that you say that because the biologists are, I'll say this, becoming like Indians. <laughs> because remember, indigenous people, particularly yeah. here in California, right where we're sitting, there were more indigenous people here than there was anywhere else in the New World outside of the present site of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And the, our territories, our nations were small, but we had such an intimate knowledge of that landscape so that we knew our entire our entire culture history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. knew of a place uh, our territory was much like that biologist circle yeah because we'd studied it at least for 10,000 years right. so we were in one place we knew all the deer families and we knew the histories of their ancestors yeah because our ancestors knew certain uh, ancestors to the deer we knew where the quail laid their eggs we knew where all the nests were we knew if there was any new species or different species that came in or if there was a certain amount of cougars in the area or a grizzly bear yeah we knew so we had an intimate knowledge which i think is what you're suggesting um the biologists are are doing when they take one area and or ecologists and study uh, an area, one area. So we studied our entire um, national territory or uh, tribal territory in that detail. That's right. That's right. My my area of interest, my vocation rather, is ecology, which is a yeah. which is a subset of biology. Right. right. So uh, uh, ecology is um, concerned with relationships yeah and it's a very young science it's a baby story we're telling ourselves it's only a hundred years old the first ecological textbook came out in like 1903 odom's e ecology right introduction yeah. to ecology where where you have the word itself ecos meaning in greek home yes right so this is this is the names the way of home you know it's tied to other words like economy the way that that uh patterns work in relationships and you know greg i'm not a spiritual man necessarily i don't self-identify as as uh, somebody who can go there easily but when i am here and here i'm meaning sort of generalized and sort of the uh, the, the non-settled parcels of california that retain some modicum of their 
I, I hesitate to use the word original, but original character that 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 I am enveloped by so an infinite quality of relationships to such a degree that that magnitude of internetworked possibilities pushes me to something like a spiritual experience or God. That is God, mm. perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 <laughs> it's a way of thinking about. But let me just jump back. First of all, I want to correct myself because I, or a thing you mm. helped me clarify, because I said biologists and ecologists are, of course, a, as you said, a subset of um, biologists. Yeah. But I, I think when you think about also, as I think about an indigenous point of view or my uh, homeland, um, we couldn't imagine a world that we weren't a part of the ecology. I mean, it's almost as if science and the Western world is now discovering the indigenous world of interrelationships and interdependency That's and right. beginning to study it. Mm -hmm. And again, as our, a lot of our old prophets, Mrs. Parrish, the, the great uh, uh, Indian leader here, uh, an Indian doctor and shaman, said uh, in the 50s, she said there's going to be a time towards the end of this world, as we know it, when the non-Indian people are going to be coming back and discovering that we were right and discovering they're going to need, look, be looking to, to us for answers. And it's interesting because what ecologists are not only seeing, Obi, um, the way there's interrelations between animals, but how in fact we are part of this whole thing and everything we do has effect, cause and effect. And we understood that. We understood that if you mess with something, it's going to have consequences. All our coyote stories are about coyote thinking he was smart and messed with things and it came back on him. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that is sophisticated. I think that is nuanced. I think that is really important. I think some of the permutations that you are implying are incredibly profound. What I hear you saying is that nature itself and I'm a proponent of this idea that nature itself, one, never really existed in California apart from human culture. There is no nature without humanity. There is no humanity without nature. Nature, the death of nature. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you said God earlier. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would suggest that, that as we philosophically like don't need God. Right, or spirit, nature whatever itself, you want. Life. Nature itself. Life. life. Okay, sure. Sure, yeah, that's right. The ubiquity. It's, it's all around. We yeah. are entirely enveloped by it. I'm just looking up at to, a to such a degree. big uh, hawk flying over. But go ahead. Uh, was that one of your... You, you call them chicken hawks, but it's I a call Cooper's them, hawk. Cooper's hawk, but yeah, I, yeah we call them chicken hawks. Um, uh, we're talking about coyote. Maybe it heard me because a chicken hawk is coyote's nephew. Oh. But uh, the oh. water up there, the pool up there, they are, are sitting around it and there's... They're, uh, pooping all around it. <laughs> the babies, there's a whole family of them here. <laughs> <laughs> the hawks, not the coyotes. Not the coyotes. Not no. the coyotes. Yeah. Well, um, have you noticed like a relationship between the coyotes and the crows up here? Like um, yes. Um, the crows, uh, they often compete. You know, they're noisy. They're, mm -hmm. they're, if, you want to, if you want to know what's going on around you, there's two birds to listen to. And, of course, that's the blue jays. Yeah, because if you're hunting or doing anything or out and about and you want to be secretive and they see you, of course, they squawk and tell everybody. <laughs> I mean, by everybody, I say all the other birds and animals. The hey, there's day. a big I there's a big their song. Yeah. But they're, they but, you know, they're so noisy. They always yeah, they give you up. You want to hide and watch animals. Yeah. Let a blue the blue jays blow your cool all the time. <laughs> crows. I don't know what they're I guess crows are more manipulative. They'll use you to the extent that um you're useful to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm. and they're, they're like coyotes. They're tricksters. They're, um, y you know, the, the crow or a raven, you can teach them more languages than um, any kind of bird, a parrot, any kind of parrot. But you know why you can't domesticate them well? They can't be trusted. You put them in a cage. <laughs> Obi, you put can them, trust them to be a crow. You can trust them. <laughs> that's the problem because you have to. You, they'll prove that they're a crow. You put them in a cage, teach them 20 languages if you want, and then you think, oh, they're all friendly and nice. I'll put it out on my hand, and yeah. it'll scratch you or peck you, but it'll certainly fly away and say, ha ha, it was fun visiting you. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I think, of, I think of scrub jays and crows both as being corvids, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're very simil similar 
uh, not only biologically but behaviorally yeah. as well in 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 certain ways yeah. now now scrub jays are like gardeners yeah where where um where crows are scavengers More opportunistic they op that's right yeah, they're that's opportunistic right. they're yeah. operators that's right that's they're right. they're calculating yeah. and that's why they have such an interesting relationship with coyote too yeah and you, and you see this up north too with like wolves and ravens it's yeah like between the corvids and the canids there is this relationship like coyotes don't eat crow in fact they will let they will often share a uh, 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 share a meal right together yeah and the, and and puppies will be playing with crows you know and and so there's this like there's this relationship, relationship. that is uh that is 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 i i love really obvious relationships like that in yeah. the ecology between big vertebral vertebral species you yeah know, that you can really see yeah. and and make sense of on a on a on a, on a human level on a societal level yeah a community scale yeah right like that 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 is a that is a language a dialogue happening that uh that that makes me be, makes me understand somehow intuitively that sacred time as i've heard you say before sacred time is ongoing yeah so like even even the idea of like once when animals were people i think you say and and how a mountain was made. Yes. Yeah. When animals were people, were being that it happened in the past, but the past is also the unfolding now. What of course it is. That? The past yeah. will always be simultaneously the present. But you reminded me something of speaking of crows, and uh, I was thinking of the buzzards, of the vultures mm, right. um, up here. And there's a story of the time when the animals were still uh, people up here. And this explains, remember, um, both the crows and the buzzards will feed off of carrion, right? right? So a coyote kills something, right. and... The story goes that the crow, they were uh, two people and they, the crow was very greedy and um, would get there first and thought he was really smart and would get in there and eat all what was left of the meat of the deer that the coyotes had killed, right? Right. And there wasn't much for the uh, buzzard left, mm. for the buzzard to eat. Mm. So what happened is they got into a, a war, a, a battle, and uh, coy uh, the buzzard... <laughs> the buzzard um, got a bloody face, but that was how, in fact, he won. Oh. He still got that red head, which enables him now to get his head into the meat deeper where the crow can't get. <laughs> so that'll teach That's him. Right. Think right. about that. Oh, Think I love, about that. I like that. Buzzards are now able, actually, to dig in deeper than a crow All because right. they can go in deeper into the body. Right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's good. There that's again, a good story. so these stories, you know, we have these stories that explain. And again, those stories are full of morals. Right, that's, right. <laughs> it's not explaining in a scientific sense, necessarily. The metaphor goes on to explain other aspects of relationships. Yeah. Uh, I am always wondering about what is happening now in these very novel ecosystems that are unfolding around us with you know within the past 170 years this place is dramatically different talk about those dramatically different on the scale of the vertebral vertebral species like i was talking about before species with backbones right the mm -hmm. bears the lions uh the the, the fish the elk yeah. Right. These are this is all radically transformed and yet still very much vital. I mean, not unlike the human cultures mm -hmm. <laughs> of of our of our locality here on Sonoma Mountain. Um you know, and and in fact resurgent now yes. too. You know, yeah. we were talking before earlier today about you believe that you have about you have tens of thousands of lizards. You know, in this vicinity here. Um, it seems like such a, to know that there are populations like that of any other creature besides human <laughs> strikes me as such a relief, 
somehow. Like vultures, for example, turkey vultures across North America, right? Turkey vultures, our new world vulture. We've got about four and a half million vultures. Yeah. It seems like a lot a up here on the mountain, yes. And yet so different are they from the California condor. Yes. Which just in my lifetime, I mean, in the eighties we were down to between seventeen and twenty two individuals. Depends on, on on the research that you cite there. Uh but but now but now that we have condor re released, reintroduced that we've hatched, yes. Yes, <laughs> with with yes. with the Yurok tribe up there in the Klamath mm-hmm. River. That that uh, once again, the condor soaring over the tallest forest in the world. Yeah. Um, I I I think that that says something about hope on the land that is very important. That gets to what we were talking about before, regarding uh, what nature is. You know. Obi, you make me think of uh, the time we're in right now, which is a a time of major transformation right before our eyes. I mean, the climate disaster is going to radically change the landscape as we know it. But think about that. For us Indian people here, this is the second time. Mm. The first time is when the Europeans came. Oh. And imagine, you mentioned last 150, 170 years. Right. So we watched the landscape in a very short time, from the time the Spanish first landed here, but you know, certainly by the time California became a state in 1850, sure. the landscape, the environment, be totally transformed, totally unrecognizable to us, right before our eyes. And imagine there weren't golden hills. There were bunch grasses, right? right? The golden hills happened so quickly. And, you know, people think, oh, we've been thinking, oh, climate disasters down the road. We don't have to worry. In a mere 50 years where we're sitting right now would was unrecognizable to the indigenous people who lived here, where there were huge oak trees, where there was controlled burning that took care of these huge, what you might want to call savannas, and huge herds of elk and pronghorn, pronghorn all over these hills, great herds, uh, quail in great numbers, the water. And within 50 years, the water table here dropped an average of 50 feet. Creeks went dry in the summer where they hadn't before. And so all of a sudden, think of our people, our ancestors, who um, just several generations ago, which in geologic time is very short, uh, uh, not even a bat of an eye, saw transformation. And um, we survived, but now that should teach us it can happen again and is happening. And what are we going to do? How are we going to live in that? Well, the unraveling never stops. It never stops. It never stops. There's always consequences. That's right. It never it never stops since since contact. Uh, we've we've been on this trajectory towards simplification, to use a term in ecology, right? Away from complexity, away from diversity, towards. There, there's some debate as to whether or not the sixth mass extinction on the planet is actually happening or not depending on, on on the numbers that you throw around like wh- where and and depending on the bottleneck that we're in right now I mean I mean the fact that you and I are having this discussion right now which is Greg it's crazy this conversation that we get to have I am I, I, I driving up here this morning Greg I I wept yeah the sun was coming up over the east here I am getting a little uh, over Sonoma Mountain, and it was so beautiful and tragic. I mean, I see, and I feel it in my own heart, as I make these big books on California geography, trying to, as you say, know this place mm-hmm. and to establish my own relationship with it. And in, inside of this culture that is so full of so much nihilism, here you and I are on this, you know, newly launched podcast called Place and Purpose, which is crazy. Why would you want to do that? Like philosophically, the the, the posture of pessimism doesn't have to do with like, oh, things are going to turn out badly. I mean, in a literary sense, as you know, as a you know, 
professor of literature. Uh, pessimism is is the idea is the idea that there's like this liberating negativity. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything, man. Yeah. We are just we are we are just a echo in a void. Yeah. And I am an optimist philosophically. Not I don't think things are going to turn out well from some false ideology. Uh, but I believe that things mean things. Cause I, and I search for that in my own heart. Obi, what I've said to so many people lately and my students, and particularly young people who, um, again, uh, a nihilism seems to be so, as you mentioned, so pervasive now as a result of this pessimism. People are saying, well, what use is it? I'll, you know, I'll just, uh, uh, I'll just burn up and eat as much as I can or get as much as I can. Um, but um, that's, I think, um, really problematic uh, in so many ways because um, we're, we're still here. And I think that just to give up and not do anything is a cop-out and a lack of responsibility to that sunset you saw this morning. That's right. <laughs> it's a lack of responsibility. Um, if, if I'm getting this, if I'm still eating in this world and taking from this world, what keeps me from um, not giving? The other problem that I don't like today, o Obi, is so often is a cynicism. Cynicism is the sin of the ages, right? Oh, there's no spirit. There's no, who cares about nature? Oh, that's just hippies or whatever. Right. The cynicism, particularly among young people, bothers me because they're not old enough to be cynical. Cynical assumes that you're, you've lived and you've seen things and all that, and you're, you're separate from that. But Obi, the big thing is, um, I think that when we get, when we're pessimistic, yeah. when we're cynical, um, we we forfeit our ability to be engaged. We forfeit our ability to be engaged, and I, I think that I think it's much more important. I think to say, okay, we're here, and don't let the pessimism, don't let the news rob us each day of the opportunity to live and live well. We are given a morning. You are given the sunrise. All right, where I look at the birds, I look at these things, and I said, the birds say to me, um, you're pessimistic? I'm flying around doing my thing. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? <laughs> Get off your butt and do something, Greg. Uh, Be well. Do what you can. The symbol of fire, I think, is fire on the land and in our hearts, the inner fire and the outer fire. From a Californian's perspective, and I mean that word, that word very um, broadly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, from, from ancient to modern, right, is, is, is the idea of, of, of letting go. It's, it's, it's a lesson that, that, that California will always teach us. And it can be a bitter lesson. It's a relationship to the material world and to a kind of, as Wendell Berry calls it, an industrial fundamentalism, mm -hmm. right? That, that nature, the thing that burns, is an enemy of civilization and of progress, right? And seeing that makes... The stuff that burns then, the trees, the more than human world, the enemy of development. And if there is a, there's a righteousness about that, that I think is pessimistic. I think that there is crossover there between the attitude of none of this means anything so let's just burn it all down anyway. Let's or it's going to burn, so what's the use? Or it's going to burn, so what's the use? 
Well, that's that that was that was Mabel's prophecy, isn't it? We should get yeah. Into that. Did, what was that? To, tell me that story. Well, and that kind of ties into what we were just talking about before this, and I, you know, as I, I've told the story before, where I Mabel I, it was forty years ago, forty five years ago, Obi, uh, I used to, as I say, driving Miss Mabel. I used to take her to Stanford to talk and all of this sort of thing, and it was funny. As she said to. All those professors want to analyze me. Um, so uh, anyway, they were down there asking her questions. We were driving home, and uh, we were. she was living at that time, just had begun living up at the Yoshidehi uh, Rancheria Reservation. And we were coming from Stanford, going through Fairfield. And um, she looked at, out at the dry hills there. It must have been in the fall, uh, sometime late summer, fall. And she said... Uh, uh, everything's going to go dry. Everything's going to burn. And uh, she said, that's my latest dream. And she was a dreamer, a prophet. She saw so many things. And, um, of course, I was younger and more stupid than I am now, perhaps. And uh, I said, Mabel, then what do I do? What do we do? Like, oh, my gosh, if you're saying everything's going to burn, you know. And she started laughing, Obi, and she said, that's cute. What do I do? making fun of me almost and I and she often did because I was again and she was the great interlocutor and made you think about how you were thinking and uh, I said no Mabel I'm serious what do we do and uh, she took a silent beat as we say in the theater and then she looked at me as I'm driving over and she said you live the best way you know how what else like the uh, the scrub jays or the, the like hummingbirds. What, do you know they agree? Do you hear how noisy they've become? <laughs> they they like what we're saying. Look at listen to that. <laughs> Don't think they're not they listening, Obi. They of course they're the listening. Conversation. You're all welcome. We're not separate here. They're all right. they're all chi listen. They're all chiming in all around here right now. <laughs> so, yeah, you told me that story a couple of months ago, and I've been living with it. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things that I would like to talk to you about like this idea that we're not going back there's no regressivism to a some sort of imagined california of uh, uh, sort of the dream of the restorationist right that we're going to go back to giant redwoods and and uh, elk and pronghorn all at once. Yeah, there's no human who has ever seen old growth come back. And I think I think there is no putting the genie back in the bottle of industrial fundamentalism. Say right. So so we have what we have. And. But the story that we're telling ourselves is changing. And that's, that's why I'm sitting here with you. Like, why, why do we tell stories? I mean, you and I are both storytellers. Well, Obi, It's hard work. Why are we working so hard? <laughs> I'm so glad you brought this up because, um, you know, people always think, um, they, uh, how do we get back to where we were? We, have to, we can't think like that. We can't go back to where we were. We can look back and learn from both the mistakes and the things that were positive, like we can learn that controlled burning is important. Right. We can understand that, but we can't go back. And we also have to understand that um, blood does not presuppose point of view. You don't have to be an Indian to somehow be into nature. Yeah. You know, if you're breathing, you're into nature. Right. <laughs> you right. know, so this whole crazy notion <laughs> that somehow the Indians will teach us or we have a corner on it. If you're breathing, we're all here now. This is part of this picture where we are. Um, you And, you know, blame. We can't be preoccupied with sins of the past or blaming non-Indian people for everything. We're here now together. So how in a dialogue such that you and I are having... How can we begin to think about ways of being in the present, feeling good about where we are, being thankful for the day, and going forward living the best way we know how? 
Mm-hmm. That's what this. That's what we still have the opportunity. What an opportunity that you and I have to sit here and talk. What an opportunity after you saw that beautiful sunrise coming up here, Obi, and then felt at times sad. And what do I do? I think I, isn't this kind of living the best way you know how? It's true. <laughs> well, uh, the philosopher Ernest Becker in his book The Denial of Death says, "I mean that that that's." <sighs> Part of the problem, at least half of the problem, ab- about like why we why I have a hard time just doing what the scrub jay does yeah. and living my best life yeah. is that we are half animal, as he says, and we are half symbolic. Yeah. Right. So so we have this cognitive capacity that is unique in the fossil record. Um, in many ways, it resembles coyote. I mean, I spend most days chasing my own t- tail. Um, or sitting on it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Wrestling with these paradoxes that I embody in my own self as yeah. a particular racial persuasion inside my community from a particular economic demographic with a particular gender bias, mm-hmm. a particular sexual orientation, all of these limiting factors that that are you know an, 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 uh, can be can be leveraged to be a perspective on my voice because I am an artist that's my original vocation it'll be my last vocation too I'm sure you know I'm going to spend the rest of my mortal days exploring what that means inside of this culture and inside of my heart and inside of my body uh and how but 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 i want to deconstruct the heroism the heroic inside of that and that's where i find so much paradox is because i i want to not be that yeah i don't want to be an expert i i find i find great hubris i find great ignorance in 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 being that it, and I mean to continue the paradox inside of a paradox inside of a paradox because this it spirals down. You know, I have so much faith in science. I believe science yeah. is a basket large enough to hold all of our philosophies. I realize I'm using the word basket there, and I'm talking to the the, <laughs> the chairman of the Federated the Federated Indians of Great Rancheria. But um, but uh, you know the the basket is as a as a technology as a, as a as a um, device of of spirals within spirals. Uh, um, uh, science to be a scientist to be an expert at something, scientists have a very small range. Edward Wilson said that you can, well, and it's based on this idea of discovery as well. Mm -hmm. So. Or the scientists always think they're going to get to the bottom of something. Get to the bottom (laughs) of something. Well, Edward Wilson said that that the measure of success of a scientist can be defined by um, uh, three words. I discovered that. Let me say what Gregory Bateson said, though. Okay. (laughs) The, the, the best thing that uh, consciousness or science can teach us is its limits. Ah. Uh, <laughs> okay. The best is its limits. Its limits. It can't see eternity. It can't see everything. So the more it focuses. Um, so, and I want to go back to Maybe. just to, Maybe. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think rejoice, one of the great ways to rejoice and get, and, uh, undo our hubris as we sit here is simply watch that buzzard flying. You and I can't do that. Mm. We never will. Mm. And if we do, wow, then we've tapped into some part of eternity. Oh, we're not going to fly. We're not going to live as long as these trees. And look at some of these big rocks around here. My God, think of what they've seen and witnessed. And you and I are just what sitting here think, think, and you and I are sitting here, we ain't going to see half of that, mm. a, a quarter of it, a fraction of it. The eternity around us is so much bigger than us. Just being here in this moment is, as a human being who can talk about it, I think is one of the most 
wonderful things. It is, but is, uh, but certainly our capacity to imagine this half symbolic side we have can stretch towards. Like I begin it, like I began this conversation with the relate the infinite relationships in ecology are accessible to the depths of our imagination. And I believe that just as our perception is potentially infinite and the narratives we have that we can build around that perception, it might be that the experiments that we can build to test those hypotheses are equally as infinite going forward. That's true. You know, you make me think, uh, uh, again, you're so good talking to you over because it, you bring up so many things that often I think about or sometimes forget. But I'm thinking about S.E. Parrish, again, the great Kashaya Pomo prophet, um, who said, um, the scientists always want to ask how my brain works. She was, again, a prophet in all this, so they want to know how her brain works. And uh, she said, uh, I, all I can say is this. Half of the brain, half of my brain sees beautiful people, might see a plant, a beautiful plant, a beautiful dress, a new car, something. But she said the other half sees eternity, the mm -hmm. everlasting, she called it. I mm -hmm. see the everlasting. And she, the other thing she said, and I told you this before, Obi, she said, all the answers on earth live in my body. And if I took enough time to look, I would know. So that is a way of thinking that we are simultaneously everything. We are. If we just took the time to look. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting, too. I think of also like this, okay, a couple of things. Now, who, was, who, was, who did you quote there about consciousness and our limits? Who was that? Gregory Bateson, the great psychobiologist. I oh, mean, very Gregory, important. Of course, of course. Yes. Bateson, yes, 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 yes. He was the one that coined the term feedback loops. Yes. And runaway systems. That's right. 50 years ago, That's 60 right. years ago. He had been married to Margaret Mead, but he was a visionary. He was a scientist. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Bateson, uh, MacArthur, Wilson. I mean, these, these All are, of those folks, yeah. It's, it's a brand new story. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I feel that with like, you know, the... Um, Remember what Bateson said, conscious purpose versus nature. Conscious pur purpose. purpose versus nature. Okay, yeah. There's that word again. Very problematic word, this, yeah. and this nature word. Yeah. Okay. okay, but I just want to touch on consciousness and get back to the infinite inside yeah. of that. Uh, in, in 1973, a uh, uh, neurophysiologist uh, named um, Thomas Nigel wrote, wrote a very influential essay called What It Is Like what it is like to be a bat and in it he proposed a definition of what consciousness is which yeah. is which is the idea of like it is like something to be a bat right yeah. so it is like like that bat is having a subjective experience and uh, and what that is is so vastly outside of our experience in our body potentially right yeah that that uh, uh, you know, I wonder. I wonder about living inside of an environment of sound, inside of a, an ecosystem that takes place at night or in in low light, at least, or 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 like a butterfly, like inside of a inside of a reality that is defined by perfume, a landscape of such vastly different sensorial input yeah. that uh, it it transcends. Know, this mammalian mask that we are tied to with our binocular vision and our and our particular way of masticating food inside of a saliva filled mouth and and you know the 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 ears on both sides of our heads you know it's like we 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 we're, we're and yet on the inside we can imagine all of these things uh is is like getting back to the ethics of it, right? Which, which is which is um, which is basis for my optimism, which is basis basis for my meaning, the meaningfulness of form. Uh, in the interrelatability of that, in the telling of this unfolding story, which is potentially also resurgent. 
Obi, I, you know, again, you're, you're making me think. I think consciousness is the thing that makes us human. Uh, okay. Okay. Consciousness, okay. but it simultaneously separates us from nature. Mm. So just like science and everything else, we have to understand the limits of consciousness. Consciousness allows us to plan, to make nuclear bombs, to do whatever. Sure. It, right. So we have to understand the limits. But when you talk about bats and other things, you know, imme- you know, and it's wonderful to imagine, for instance, the life of a butterfly in a week, eternity in a week. Yeah. Perfume and eternity in a week. Um, but um, I, it makes me think of, the, in fact, the story of the Buddhist monk, and you, I'm sure mm. you've heard this, who was on a, standing on a bridge looking down at these beautiful fish, and uh, he was talking to somebody, and uh, he said, the other person was saying, what do you think the fish are thinking down there swimming around? And the monks, Buddhist monk simply said, I don't know, I'm not a fish. <laughs> Which sounds like something Mabel would say. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'll, uh, again, That's another pretty good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 it, it, that makes me think of another parable of, of of the fish, who is the old fish who's talking to the younger fish, and and the old fish says, "Hey kids, how's the water?" And and as the young fish are swimming away, he said, they say, "They say, what's water?" <laughs> Wonderful. There you go. Precisely. Um, but that makes me think of, again, a story from Mabel McKay, Ovi, when she was at Stanford and the students, one of the students, you know, she was talking about being a medicine woman and all that. And a student, a young undergraduate said, uh, stood up and said, well, Mabel, do you talk to plants? And Mabel said, well, yes, if I'm going to use them. I have to uh, pick them. I have to talk to them. I have to, there's songs I have to sing for them and all of that. And the student then said, oh, okay, well, then, Mabel, do plants talk to one another? And she goes, yeah, I, I believe so. And then the student <laughs> pushed further and said, well, what do they say to one another? What are they talking about? And Mabel said, well, how would I know? Why would I be listening? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that <laughs> there, there's a lot there, Greg. There's a lot there. You know that what that makes me think of is the way uh, we could we we should talk about trees talking to each other since yeah. we since this whole conversation so far has been about the abiotic aspects of uh, of fire in the land of geography itself, uh, and and the, and then and then we've got like big animals, birds, bats, coyotes, trees. Uh, trees, like, uh, oak trees across California do a very interesting thing. As, as, as I know, the, the, the ethnobotany here is deep and rich about yeah. what an acorn actually is. And the way that oak trees will communicate with each other over hundreds of square miles to decide that this is going to be a mast year. When everybody, when all the all the oak trees seem to decide together that they're going to make tons of acorns. Tons of acorns. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it turns bay trees out, too, by the way. And they do the same do thing, exact right. same thing. And probably through similar mycorrhizal. Yes, all underneath the ground. They're communicating the root systems. With the great yeah. Yeah. biological dark matter of this planet. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the, the, the best theories that we've got about why this happens is, is uh, really to... Uh, control the populations of grazing herbivores uh, to uh, uh, such that they the herbivores don't become dependent on the one acorn f- the one food source mm-hmm. I mean you have to remember that uh, just before the Holocene Cal- when California looked much different during the last glacial maximum when the Farallon step you could walk from San Francisco to the Farallon Islands this was, this yes was, this was yes this was we the watched territory from the this Anna. mountain mm-hmm. uh, we watched the bay fill imagine that <laughs> the bay fill yeah you, with that's water right. I that mean, was about 6,000 years yeah, ago yes, yes before then something happened between then and then though I want to talk about this period of time between the last glacial maximum and the filling of the San Francisco Bay which happened very rapidly. Talk mm-hmm. about sea level rise yes. and climate change. I mean, you, you talked about the first time within you saw a couple the, generations. Actually, it was three quarters of an inch a year of yeah. of, of 
sea level rise. We've seen three quarters of an inch in the last century. Yeah, this twenty first century. But it's rapidly go moving that almost annually. <sighs> yeah. So, as I said earlier, as we were our conversation circling back, Obi, um, just as indigenous people then witnessed such a radical change. And then with the coming of the Europeans, a radical change, now all of us are in the midst of this. How are we going to live? What are we going to do in place? Um, again, how are we going to know place and learn how important we are as a part of wherever we're living? It is so nice to be sitting here with you today. I'm not... I'm not here to sell my books. You know? Or mine. I, I mean, <laughs> you can sell mine. I'll sell yours. <laughs> <laughs> Go to HeydayBooks.com. Yes, they're both there. <laughs> and they're both there. <laughs> In yeah. fact, the great Heyday yeah. Books is the reason yeah. why we're here together yes. today yeah. at all, ultimately. Yes. Well... Yeah, I think we're going to run into each other regardless. We've got too much in common. <laughs> we <laughs> we talk about too many of the same things. But I, I love to fantasize about, to muse about the discussions that must have been had watching the bay fill. Because the, the area between what is now the, 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 the San Joaquin Bay Delta out in the valley where the San Joaquin River from the south the Sacramento River from, from the north joined at one point to form the California River, as it was called, uh, or as paleoclimatologists call it, from, from uh, you know, from, from like Tracy. It yeah. ran out through the Golden Gate out towards the Fairline Islands. This, 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 inc this, this, this tunnel of, of, uh, of, uh, of salmon and adramus fish, all types there that, that, uh, Fed everyone. I mean, I, it and must everything. have felt like the yeah, world was ending then. Yeah. Uh, it, and that happened before at the last glacial maximum, too, when at the beginning of the Holocene, there were over two dozen species of herbivore that existed within the California floristic province that weighed over a ton. I mean, we had we had everything from mammoth to sloth to the largest camel that ever existed in the fossil record. Nine and feet that, the, uh, the saber tooth, right? Oh we, yeah, Smilodon, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Feeding on all of these. Yes, yeah. Oh, and 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 uh, and the short-faced bear. Yes, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, who was very vicious apparently. Oh, yes. And could run long-legged, yeah. yes. 6 feet at the shoulder. Yeah. Um all of them gone. Yeah. And so what you can imagine with all those herbivores hell of a lot of grazing. The fire regime across California was much different then because of all of the grazing going on. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 think, I think historically something happened and I, and I wonder what kind of experiments can be like. It, it's gonna, it, it, it sort of will have to vacillate between narrative tradition and archaeological evidence about the peopling of California and how anthropogenic fire on the land really took over stewardship from all the herbivores that were there before in the great Californian Serengeti, right? Well, also, though, ultimately enhanced the proliferation of herbivores here. Absolutely. <laughs> So Absolutely. as the other ones went, the proliferation of the elk and the pronghorn and the deer here were dependent upon open grasslands. And open grasslands um, were dependent on the controlled burning. On the controlling, on the controlled burning. So again, humans being such a part of the ecology, you see. Right, right. Such a part of the ecology that, that the two are not separate. Like, no, no. The, so, so well, as they say, co-evolve. That's right. So I wonder then if, if, if we're not actually in an ecological crisis, but actually like a crisis of like objectivity, if you will. And what I mean by that is like this subjectivity that we have, that I am separate from nature, that nature is a something outside of me at all is preventing us from 
uh, well, one is preventing us from, from getting through this bottleneck in a timely manner, getting on to some, like, letting go of the age of progress, say, and into, like, the age of resiliency, right? Which is... We're, we're, we're in a state of transformation. That's, that's exactly we're what We're in a state about. of transformation. And I, what you said is so important. Let's go... What Essie, yeah. I think, Parrish was saying um, is that when she says all the answers are in my body, she understood that in her body is all of evolution, all of time, all of uh, existence in nature, everything. We are a part. We're not separate. Consciousness sometimes fools us, and that's what we're reminded. Song, ritual, art, those things always took us back, reconnected Fool us. us. Fool us. Yes, we got to be careful. And that's why the coyote stories are so good, because coyote was conscious. He thought he was, he could trick, do other things, because he thought he was smart. And there were always consequences. Some of them were good, but lots of them were bad. You had to think about the consequences. And um, so, uh, again, I think it's so important to understand or to rethink how we're here. I've quoted before, and I like to quote uh, the great Irish poet, Yeats, mm -hmm. who said, this preposterous, pragmatic pig of a world would vanish on the instant if the mind would but change its theme. And that's what we're talking about, changing how we're here. If you start thinking about, oh, it's going to end, it's going to do all of that, you're forfeiting the opportunity to live fully today. And I think that's, that's another trick. That's another trick, if you want to call it, of destruction, of death, of, of a culture that wants to kill itself. So now it's tricking us into being pessimistic and giving up, and it's all going to be gone. Yep. It's not all going to be gone. Mabel McKay, they used to ask her, well, you're an Indian doctor. You're the last of the sucking doctors that took pain out of people's bodies. What's going to happen when you go? Who are you teaching this to? If you're not teaching it to anybody, and it, she wasn't, at, at the, and who, what's going to happen when you go? And she laughed. She thought that was hysterical. And she said, the spirit isn't going to go anywhere. It's not going to hide under a rock. <laughs> It's here. The more I learn about <laughs> California Indians and specifically the stories that are told yeah. about uh, making sense of the world, the world. Yeah, I like that turn of phrase to making sense, you know, sense making. Uh, the sense is uh, uh, so plain spoken are you there's no tradition of mask wearing in ritual storytelling as far as i understand across the greater area of california as opposed to somewhere like the that's a good the, way to put it actually, the, yeah. the, the the pacific northwest which yeah. has a tradition of mask wearing it's all mask wearing in fact in fact I, I read somewhere that, that the that the the coaquil or the Haida the word for ritual is the same as as like theater or trick. Yeah. Like the the facade, right? And that doesn't exist in California. Um, or central California here. No. Yeah, Central California. Um that's right. In, in fact, you know, we were you weren't to show off or show things, you were to be very plain. Um Industrial worlds, nation states, always privilege and demand homogeneity, people being mm. alike, marching mm. in order. In California, indigenous cultures, not just here, but throughout Africa and other places, they cherished heterogeneity mm. or difference. The more different or odd you were, the more intriguing you were. Um, right. So you more, in fact, like diverse you are, right. like nature, the more interesting you are. And you didn't always know, so you respected. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, again, is a way to begin thinking about it. Nation states, you know, the coming of age for young indigenous people here, women had their rituals and men, young men had theirs. Um, but it was always it, sort of an induction into secret cults, how you knew the world in secret ways associated with animals. Whereas for us, and it, you never knew it was all different and complicated. Mm. The coming of age story for a young woman today is, you know, how can you look like Beyonce? Yeah. It's all the Ooh. same. It's all Ooh. this kind of homogenous kind of stuff that sells and keeps this monster of detachment going. Monster of detachment. 
I, I, well, well, the heterogeneity, that's such an interesting, like, indigenous criticism. Yeah. Of this industrial yeah. fundamentalism, this paradigm that, that, that we're working to shirk off, like this, like this snake getting out of its skin, um, at least that's 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 how I feel of of the of the weird countries. Oh, the deer are joining us. Um, Who are they there? Yeah, just behind the bay over there. Uh, of the weird countries, right? W e i r d, Western, uh, um, educated, okay. industrial, rich, yeah. developed, yeah. weird countries. You know, yeah. uh, you know, like the 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 thing that is happening. Uh, uh, so so that, especially in California, where we see this 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 language diversity. Uh, pre-contact California, yeah. just incredible language diversity, where we see, and this is still a global phenomena yeah. of, of ethnography, that where you see more languages, you see a corresponding increase in the biodiversity of that biological province, right? So, uh, I mean, California remains one of the world's biological hotspots here, you know, and I think of, I think of our very low extinction rate. I think of like this, this miracle that we have, Greg, and again, I think this conversation here with you today is, 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 is a miracle that, that something entirely improbable given, given, uh, the history of the past 170 years, the colossal catastrophe that is post gold brush statehood for the biological entity that is California. And that, but that, I'm calling it a catastrophe to acknowledge trauma. Trauma that is now 500 years old written on the, on the body of Californians. Um, that I feel, you know, in, inside of the, the paradox that is me, right, which is the, which is the settling agent. How do I be more from here? Learning from these indigenous patterns, the patterns that are written on the landscape, the hope that is here. Obi, I think what I'm hearing you say is how do we finally become home? Mm. How, do, how are right. we home? And let's just jump back, and I'll be very arbitrary here, and start with the story of the Israelites um, released from slavery. And um, two things happened. Oh. They went into the desert, and they were promised a home by God because um, they'd lost their home. Story they, of Exodus. Yeah, the story yeah. of Exodus. They, yeah. They'd been colonized, yeah. let's call it that, yeah. enslaved, right. and then they are freed, and they're out wandering around. They're promised a home, and they're told um, by God that they're special. Forty tribes, right? Forty, Forty tribes yes. of the indigenous Israelites. Israelites, and they're told that you are owed a home, and um, you are special. You're entitled to a home. And what happened then is they went, that story went, and they colonized somebody else because they were entitled and special and owed a home by God. God told them. And then what happens? Each religion's different things spawn. Christianity, Mohammedism, and they all replicated that everywhere they went. And new nationalisms grew. And we are still, 3,000 years later, looking for a home. How do we be home? Uh, and in the process, we've uprooted everybody. I mean, some people proselytize the Jewish people, of course, don't. But uh, the Christians and the Maha the Muslims certainly do, uh, have done that, want an interest in converting. And uh, taking over the earth in such ways, and we replicate nationalisms and create this us-them relationship, not just with the world, but with one another. So mm. how do we stop mm. that story mm. that's endemic all in the indigenous people, African people, all of us who've been colonized somehow b have become part of this mindset of us, them. Even as we become more Indian or more indigenous Jewish or whatever we want to be, <laughs> we, we still um, have this us, them. How do we create a home for all of us that's safe? How do we become home? and share and not have to fix nature or other people 
to suit ourselves. How do we undo a narrative in, of entitlement? Oh, uh, okay. Okay, entitlement. That's good. How do, we, how do we keep our rights but attend to our responsibilities? Yeah. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. Um, yeah. So, again, we're, we're, we're caught in this old narrative that keeps replicating itself in various ways. And so we have to stop. Just stop and be home here and now you know so many what we talked at the top of this conversation obi we talked about people wanting to go back wanting it to be back the way it was you know you have these radical environmentalists and others who want to go back um or even radical ecologists who want to go back and recreate but that's that whole trick of having to go somewhere else having to run away go somewhere else stop be here ah uh, yeah that's right I, and and do they really? I don't. Know. I mean, do you think do you think uh, uh, all those people in Mill Valley would be happy with the reintroduction of grizzly bears into Point Reyes National Park? Well, you know? you know, I get a lot of criticism. The tribe gets a lot of criticism. We we did a precedent setting co management agreement with uh, to co manage fifty fifty for you know tens of thousands of acres of uh, Point Reyes. We're, well, we're going to talk about that. But what you just said is huge. Yes. And but, we're, we're going we're gonna to But like, they want us to, you know, get rid of all the cows, tear down all the fences so that the elk can just grow and repopulate. That might be sweet, but the poor elk are going to get hit on Highway 1 unless they want to get rid of that. And do they want grizzlies and cougars? That's how they kept the population down. I would argue that a lot of those radical environmentalists and others from Marin County the first grizzly bear that got in their backyard or the first cougar that ate their kid, they would stop that very fast. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. That's right. Well, I, I, I applaud your bravery. bravery. Um, Greg, I, I, see, I see you and your position politically as a, as a very uh, noble endeavor, uh, even heroic, like in, in the most positive sense. You know, I mean, I've been, I've been hanging out with some people over the past couple of years because my my books have attained a, a modicum of success here and I've been introduced to policymakers and and uh, and, and leaders um, I stop short of prescriptive narrative yeah because you know, there's little 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 velvet prince over there with his little velvet antlers. Oh yeah. Oh, and here they come. Oh. Here, yep. Wow, that's interesting. She must be a feminist. She's <laughs> pushing him around. That is great. <laughs> See things. All these narratives in nature about the bucks bothering. She's bothering him. She's pushing him around. Good for so, her. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so 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 you, you said the other day you you, you said uh, something about ecological or environmental wisdom. Yeah. And that we're going to be talking in this podcast series about environmental wisdom and thinking about what wisdom is. And I like I like the idea of origins. I like the idea of patterns. I'm comfortable with that because that is me. That is me. First first person. I'm very uncomfortable with with pluralizing uh, the first person calling it we yeah. because because then I start to delve into some ideology yeah. You know, over some territorial thought ground that I think is 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 it's simplifying politically, and I think that's a dangerous trajectory too. We need to maintain complexity and nuance in our thought patterns towards democratic society. The only way, Obi, we can think about solutions is that way. That's right. That's right. The problem, a lot of the problem that we've had, even if, as we've tried to fix things, is we've tried to fix one thing without keeping the larger picture in mind. The thing mm. we've been talking about the entire hour, where we focus on one thing and lose sight of the whole. So as we look for solutions as much as possible, we have to consider all points of view and all of all of the different species and trees that are going to be involved in the consequences of whatever decision we make. Right. That's exactly correct. No, that's very well put, Greg. You know, we, th we throw around wor words like liberal versus conservative, say, right? Mm -hmm. um, conservative, oh my goodness. The people, the people who are into traditional values, which is, uh, uh, sounds exactly like what we're talking about. 
Mm-hmm. You and I are the most conservative people I know. How about that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I am in a lot of ways. I, I, I oh my God, I, I'm, I'm, well, in too many ways, I'm rigid. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, I'm just getting old. I don't know. <laughs> rigid, rigid. Yes. Well, traditional <laughs> scientific values yeah. for sure. You know, yeah. I mean, there something happening on the 17th century too. You know, you were talking about the plot of 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 uh, finding the historic home, mm-hmm. the home inside of the heart, whatever that is. Feeling feeling like I belong here. I am mm-hmm. from here. I identify with being from here, which is something that was denied to us, I believe, from uh, an offshoot of license, a philosophical license given to us in the 17th century by the fathers of modern philosophy, like the Descartes of the world, leading into like the Hobbeses of the world, right? Where we have Descartes who said, Cogito ergo privileging sum. rational thought. Oh, privileging rational thought. Yes. To such a degree yeah. that it condemned all of nature to a disposability of, even more than that, to an unreality. Cherishing and privileging that rational thought and the extent to which you could be rational was the extent to which you were civilized and sophisticated. Mm. That became the paradigm. Mm. Right? That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. D- even it, it didn't it, it must have licensed then the the uh, the the genocide the certainly the enslavement and ultimately the attempted erasure of indigenous culture everywhere and it was the world. It, it was so I, I was reading and I read some of the old stuff that uh, my great great grandfather Tom Smith and uh, Maria Copa with in the book with Isabel Kelly mm. and I see Maria Copa refer often to the Spanish or the Mexicans, the colonizers, as people of reason. And it was a form almost, I believe, of internalized oppression because what she's saying is they're the high people, the people of reason. And she used the Spanish word raison, uh, raison, um, that the people of reason were the smart people. Us poor people, in other words, the implication was didn't have reason. Okay. Okay, that's interesting to me because because elsewhere in in your most it's recent sad. book Becoming Story, you also mention and I wonder where this comes from because cause, cause we ha- we have to talk about respect a little bit mm-hmm. and we also have to talk about um you know indigenous views of the coming of 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 European into Europeans in California specifically into the the Sonoma uh, you know Sonoma mm-hmm. Petaluma Valleys Santa Rosa Valley, we have, we have, uh, uh, we have the miracle, right? Mm-hmm. The miracle people. You called them the miracle people. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's um, you know, the Kashaya Pomo on the southwestern Pomo. And I'm sure a lot of the other uh, folks, uh, southwestern Pomo here in Coast Miwok, had comparable or similar words. But the, the Kashaya people, the older people, used to call white people palacha, which translates literally to miracles. And I always, I asked the old people, I said, why do you call white people miracles? And they said, because when they came and they were chopping down trees and damming up the water and killing animals and killing people and enslaving people, we always thought if you did anything like that, it would immediately come back on you. And look at these people. They're, they're, they're just destroying the earth. And instead of getting punished, more of them keep coming. They're violating all the things we valued. And our stories told us and we must be wrong because um, more of them keep coming. Of course, as you know, today it took, as you were saying, 170 years. And the air we're breathing right now, any water we drink, is has come back on us. It is mm. poisoning us. It just took longer. Well, it, it <laughs> took longer. What is time then? You said immediately come back. It's like, what is 170 years next to a culture that was is still intact? You know, when the bay filled, and that's really when, like, the shell mounds started being built, 500-something shell mounds in the, yeah. in the ethnonomic region that is the, is, is the Ohlone, yeah. right? Uh, so, like, the modern tribes, as far as we can ascertain, are about mm. that old. But, you know, I mean, still, here I am with my raison, you know? Yeah. It, it, thinking about linear time like that, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, 
And I wonder if, I, I wonder and I wrestle with, am I being disrespectful to the stories of then wedging that narrative I- across this timeline yeah. uh, from beginning to now, right? That in, in the term, it, like, I mean, we see clocks in the sky. We see, we see the moon happen. We see, we see the sun, the sun being like, you know, the face of eternity. It's always the same. It comes up always the same. Moon, a little bit different. Fall unfolds in different chapters. We see clocks everywhere. And so the extrapolation of the solar calendar, which did certainly occur in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, sure. and, yeah. you know, but it was always represented in a circle, not a line. You know, here I am wondering if even my concepts of time and space are disrespectful. And what I want to be is respectful. And as you point out in Becoming Story, respect is a survival tool. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, regarding the clocks... um, Another point of view, of course, many of you, look what Thoreau did. He went out and he got away from clocks, and people um, have done those kinds of things. Um, But I think respect is understanding our limits, understanding our our limits, Um, uh, and wondering, wondering, you know. um, Wonder is a wonderful thing, you know. Understanding our limits, wondering... Yeah, it is. Yeah, like just, you know, for me to go out and even when I see people, you know, um, I, I like best people who <laughs> who um, aren't, uh, don't know everything, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, um, I, you know. Um, we made that point a couple of times today. Yeah. You know, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, and, I, you know, I always try to stop myself and... Uh, you know, of course, people. I'm sure you get asked as, uh, as an artist and as a, uh, a ecologist, uh, you get asked all kinds of questions about nature. Well, they always say, well, you know, to me, what do Indians think of nature? I, I don't know. Ask one. You know, <laughs> what do Indians think of nature? Yeah, that 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 sounds that sounds like it's a, it's a flawed question yeah. from the beginning. It would be like somebody to you say, what do these? What is someone who? Right, this does these wonderful almanacs think of nature? Well, you could have answer for yourself, but you can't represent anybody, everybody who's done an almanac. You're, you know, we're all complex and different. Yeah, yeah, and um, the the word the word nature, I think is best is best applied, especially getting back to the idea of storytelling, which I imagine that this for this whole first conversation that we're having here is an introduction to the uh, way in which you and I uh, conjure abstract concepts. I mean, I'm I'm almost my my mind is going back to like the symbol of what a the basket is. You know, this mm-hmm. be- you know the designs inside of. A woven basket. Mm-hmm. Uh, the best baskets in the world are made here, <laughs> yeah. on this mountain. You know, um, uh, so so you conjure this abstract concept. You commodify it, and I don't mean to like turn that into something necessarily bought and sold, but it but it, because it is an object inside of an economy, and that economy does not need to be monetary. Mm-hmm. It it can be a spiritual economy. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's turned then into a conversational object, which is the definition of a symbol. Yeah. Right. So this is an indigenous critique of nature in my yeah. i in 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 the most optimistic sense. To again, use that philosophical term. Right. Like I grew up. Uh, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara, and I grew up exploring the San Ynez Mountains just looking for two mash art sites and there's hundreds of them across those mountains that's They're how just, many people were there yeah. oh gosh yeah. there's so many people there yeah. um not as many people as there were here i no, think i here. think this valley is the most yes, densely yes, par- yeah. populated yeah. part of 
really North America, right? Isn't yes. that what you said? Yeah. North of Mexico City, yeah. north of yeah. Tenochtitlan. Yeah. You know? yeah. In all of the New World. In all of the New World outside of the... Uh, outside of the great the, yeah, civilizations. Yeah. 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 Um, outside of the Aztec capital per capita, yeah. But I want to go back... Go ahead. Okay. No, no, I want to go back to... I want to go back to... But, um, uh, uh, you know, nature in Western thought is a place where feeling doesn't exist. How about that? Well, it's Nature's outside a, of humans. It's so outside no, of humans. And nothing feels except humans. It's, only, it's where cold science that's lives. That's the big hubris. <laughs> that's the big hubris. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting paradox. Yeah. That it's hubristic to think of some, of nature in that way. Sure, because then if it doesn't feel, you can do anything to it. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's, let me re say that's so really something. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let me say something else too. I, I mean, I think we keep thinking there's all these binaries in and out. I, nature and me, um, uh, consciousness, not consciousness. Animal life, human life. Objectivity and subjectivity. Objectivity yes. and subjectivity, and. Um, I think there's Mabel again. I'm going to go back to Mabel. Please. Mabel said, uh, there, somebody said, oh, Mabel, do you imagine that you're dreaming or spirit world or whatever, her connections or whatever you want to say? And she used to say, there's no such thing as imagination. And I used to think, oh my gosh, isn't imagination the greatest thing we have? And what is it like if you have no such thing as imagination? And then I remember once, um, talking to her and she was saying and I put these two things together she said she was uh, there was some spirit in the room with her and it was her great great grandfather who was, gave her rattlesnake songs who she never knew and she said asked him she said are you just in my imagination is this real and he answered her if I'm not real neither are you No such thing as imagination. That it's, opens it's it up. <laughs> it's, it's profoundly Zen, isn't it? Yeah. Like it's it's really it's really like. But where are the limits of this world? That's the thing. Or where consciousness are the limits even. Of the world. Yeah, it's like it's like this. this it's like my baskets are made in a circle. Why eagle builds its nest in a circle? Why the horizon is a circle? Why zero is a circle? That bridge yeah. between. Uh, real and imaginary integers in the language of mathematics. It's, it's Scott Mamaday, the great writer poet, Ooh, yeah. he also talks about that very same experience where he was sitting in the room and he thought his grandmother was there talk because he was writing about her. I, I think as the story goes, he was writing about her and he said, "Are you really here? Or I'm feeling you in the room. I just heard you talking to me." And she said the same thing to him. She said, "If you're not here, Scott, neither am I." <laughs> If I'm not here, neither are you. <laughs> well, that, that, uh, well, Obi, I, you I, know I, what? I, I see you looking and wondering. I have to quote my crazy great aunt Susie, who was funny. She, <laughs> the anthropologist, once was there talking to Mabel, trying to get all these questions and try to figure out how she does things and what happens. And <laughs> Susie, uh, eating an apple with one tooth like a squirrel, she just leaned you his, into his ear and she said, this Indian business is kind of kooky, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Hobie, I have to tell you the story. Please. She was eating that apple and she, she was a, we, we never say that our Indian women are fat. We say they're powerful. And Susie was a powerful woman. And the apple rolled <laughs> off her front her, and uh, she, and uh, rolled across the floor and stopped at his shoe. And he looked at me and he says, oh, my God. He goes, what does that mean? And I said, I think it means she fell asleep. Well, I find these thoughts, this wrestling, like, like particularly resonant delicious even yeah. you know like I, I couldn't imagine you know i mean here i am uh, you know my wife ali again you know she 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 hates like adventure movies yeah she, she fell asleep at the matrix she's like god that stuff bores me i, I think i would too <laughs> i'd have to take excedrin because of all the noise so, you know <laughs> exactly. uh but just to, uh, is it so you wrote a, a a thin little book on mabel mckay who we've mm -hmm. been talking about mm-hmm 
and it's called Weaving the Dream. Is that still in print? Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. Heyday Press, yeah. Is oh, no, University oh. of California. I'm sorry. Oops, we're, we're giving Heyday credit there. <laughs> uh, we love Heyday. Yeah, but no, press, University yeah. of California Press, and it's used widely. Um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm really touched by it. Um, and again, I had the hardest time writing that because Mabel kept saying, I'm going to fire you if you don't get it right. Do it by me. And I said, and I kept asking her, about a theme. I said, you know, because she would talk in circles and stories and all of that sort of thing. And Obiad, I always had the hardest time. And um, she sa I said, Mabel, there has to be a theme. And she goes, I don't know nothing from no theme. <laughs> so, oh God, here we go. <laughs> and I was always stupid and all this sort of thing. So I said, well, I tried to explain to her, Obi. I said, a theme is, you know, something that kind of ties all your stories together and she goes why you want to tie the stories up why you want to tie them <laughs> <laughs> there's no good answer no there's no good answer to those paradoxes no what i learned is uh and people said why'd you put yourself in there the only way you could mabel was like water you could never know how deep or complex the spring is from which it comes but you could experience it. Mm. And she benefited all the things she touched, mm. like, as water, I would say. And um, that's the only way I could do it. So as I was a young kid, you know, looking for where I belonged, hanging around for her, with her, I was doctored and healed just in my own life. And at the end of it, when she's compromised and she's had a stroke and she's in a convalescent home, I went to her and I said, Mabel, why did you do... I was starting to feel special again, Obi. And I said, uh, Mabel, why would you do this for me? Why would you, why'd you tell me all these stories? You know, why, why me? And she simply looked at me and she said, because you kept coming back. Mm. All in nature, if we keep coming back, Obi. <sighs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I thought maybe attention. I was special for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, your capacity to pay attention might yeah, be. Yeah. If if there's if you know, I think yeah. I think of so many endangered resources. Yeah. The idea of attention being yeah. one of those endangered resources. Yeah. Or or the ability to even have an honest conversation. Yeah. In in the twenty first century. In this in this in in the day of pervasive ideology and misinformation where yeah. uh you know us thumbs up them thumbs down right you know and that and, and that polarizing thought to uh, uh that that is so disrespectful there's that word again yeah right that by by putting them in some different place as you is to pessimistically, there's that word again too, is to pessimistically think that the nature of, there's that word again, <laughs> is to pessimistically think that the core of human power is corruption. Yeah. And I don't believe that. No, it can be. It doesn't have to be. That's right. Just like consciousness is a good thing that can remind us of its limits and tell us when we've overstepped our boundaries, when we've taken over, hurt somebody, hurt a tree, or gone too far. Consciousness can tell us that. At the same time, it can tell me, um, let me see how I can manipulate Obi and get money or something from him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, th the gift that we have, like fire, like everything else, the, anything that we have, and that's the thing of wonderful thing about being human, is we do have the ability to know how to be good and also then to have learned our limits. I think we're sitting here having these conversations, Obi, because it's time the human's consciousness needs stories that remind us and conversations that remind us of our limits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And our potential. Because mm -hmm. we do have the potential, potential to live. There's paradoxes there too, Greg. There's paradoxes there too. You know what I mean? Nature's full of paradoxes. You know, here we are talking 
about uh, what it is to be a thinking person in California. I think of all the paradoxes that surround us in, in, in the conservation movement, in the indigenous movement, in the, in the even even in understanding something that is so immediate, like fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got friends right now in Wairika. I got friends in Mariposa. You know, I mean, we've got we've got fire on the ground now, and we've got. 90 more days here until we see the first sort of blessed drips of precipitation that will really, you know, bring saturation back to the land, mm -hmm. potentially. Uh, <laughs> God willing. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, the, these, these keeping two thoughts in your head at the same time is a revolutionary act at this point. The idea that it is going to get worse and it is going to get better at the same time is does not make a good headline for the evening news. But it's probably the most important story we can tell as far as I can see. Yeah, and one of the problems I have, Obi, and I am a news junkie, um, is not to be undone by a notion of pessimism and the subsequent anxiety it creates. Because mm -hmm. the anxiety that mm. we live with really um, works together um, in a very negative, if you will, ecological disaster way to destroy the, the spirit. Because you get so anxious, you think, well, it's nothing, you can't do anything or everything, it's too late or whatever, and you have all this anxiety. And it, for me, it's a lot about managing anxiety and remembering the blessings of being here now and embracing that and not wasting an opportunity to talk to other people, to write, to lead my tribe, to do the right things. Um, uh, it, because wow, what an opportun what opportunities I have, we all have. Mm. So, I, I, I yes, yes, I, I've, I, I, I've, I, I, I can't I, let things get in the way of the opportunities. Yeah, I don't mean entitlements. I mean opportunities. Your leadership, that that song that you were singing, that that idea, that faith in the individual, to be able to shun out that poison that is that 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 drone of potentially misinformation that 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 national line that is a voice so often of decisiveness right that keeps the machine going that is feeding industrial fundamentalism uh you're able to incorporate that into your body. You said spirit, but I would argue that it's also very much your body. I mean, we're seeing, you know, I think, I think of like California as being a traumatized place over the past 500 years, you know, on a very human level, very sensitive to that. I can feel that in myself. I, I, tra trauma lives in the body. I think that climate change, to use the, anesthetized term climate change uh, is also written in our bodies and in, in increased rates of cardiovascular disease. I mean, cardiovascular disease is, is, is a modern phenomenon. It really didn't exist in pre-industrial times, you know. Uh, I, you were talking about Mabel's great great grandfather. I'm sure centurions in, in Pomo culture were normal. Yeah, you know, um, you know, Obi. I, I before we leave today, I you know I have to talk about myself now that we're done talking about me. Um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you know, my father's my grandmother. And look at me, I look very Anglo in many ways. And my grandmother, my Indian grandmother, she did not like white people. And uh, she, she often said, you know, the only way to handle a white person is with a knife. And um, <laughs> I can understand that, you know, yeah, boarding no, schools uh, and everything she went I'm through and all of that sort yeah. of thing. 
And then, you know, her oldest grandson, if she saw me walking down the street, she might knife me. But I want to go past that. My father, too, I mean, he internalized I, from the stories I've heard. You know, he always went after the white women and stuff like that. And, you know, this is what we do to them and all this sort of stuff. So if you look at me, I was born of kind of racial, historical racial tension. Mm -hmm. But if those bloods can get along in this body, why can't they get along in the world? Mm. You went, talked about the body. And in my blood is basically, in many ways, the history of California in all oh. senses. Ah. And I, I'm, that's, that's, uh, I'm alive. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm here. And I think if, if I want to really be egotistical, that's a lesson, at least for me, to think from, and maybe others. Yeah. And, you know, I've suffered as a consequence of this kind of stuff because, you know, when I was young, they would say, well, you're fair skinned, say you're Spanish or say you're Mexican. And then the American Indian movement came along and they said, oh, you're too light, march in the back. So we do these things of casting out and delegitimizing and privileging certain things. And in fact, in my blood, in my being, in my understanding, it's getting along. It's getting along. It's working. It's working. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a lesson I have to take. And um, as I lead my people, and I, the in, my Indian people, uh, the casino and all that stuff, I said, I'm not going to do this unless it's something that benefits Indian and non-Indian alike. We're all here. The solution must be with all. I, you know, I never did one of those genetic tests or whatever i've got seven living relatives you know i don't i'm i'm always i've always been looking for where you know my home as you say yeah. well, i've been lost in the desert forever yeah. it's funny i'm working on a book on my next manuscript which is the deserts of california right now um I, I mean, what, what a, I realize that's a very privileged thing to say, too. I mean, I, 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 I appear, I read, if you will, as a white guy, mm -hmm. cisgendered white guy, you know, and, and yet I have to be very careful about the quality of my voice and this license and this shield that I have to sort of like barge into conversations, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, especially with the legacy of, 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 I'll just say it, white dudes in nature, yeah. you know, yeah. John Muir, who is a big shadow in my mind in many r regards in how not just, in his remarks of, you know, his racist comments and his deep misunderstanding of California ecology, but in his prescriptive thought about what conservation is, there are indigenous people all over the world who are suffering today because of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and because of what, it, and I, and to think that I, you know, am I going to be, you know, that complexity theory thought, experiment where the butterfly flaps its wings in mm -hmm. Kansas and makes a tornado in Indonesia, <laughs> you know, <laughs> typhoon in Indonesia. But it's, it's like, I, so, so I feel like I'm on ice all the time and yet I come bashing in with my shield. Right. So there's, there's, there's another paradox of identity that I really look forward to working out with you over this series. Well, you know, Obi, it, it it, it it hurts me when I hear people feel badly about their identity um, racially or any other way mm. because, in fact, we're all sacred and the one we all have the same potential. And there's that tendency to be condemned by the sins of the past given where you are and that sort of thing. And that's another thing that has to stop. The past is something we learn from. We're all here together. What did we learn about the way people look, which is what we're talking about. 
what did we what can we learn from the genocide here in California? Do just because you're white or Spanish or something or European, do you have to be punished or whipped? And just because you're Indian now, do you have to, you know, want revenge or equality? No, we can't play that game anymore. We just can't. But what we can learn, and I tell my students, is what, how was that able to happen that some people looked at another people and nature in a certain way that had the consequences it did? Mm. And that's what you and I are talking about right now. We continue to work that out. How do we... How do we rethink, how do we learn from the past about what constituted or predicated the mistakes that people made that hurt one another and are hurting us still today and the land around us? So the what, you, what it sounds like you're talking about there is, is very interesting. We're going to have a whole episode on the idea of, of justice. Yeah. And, what, and there's this... You know, I'm not talking about retributive justice. Yeah. I'm talking about justice being the like a restorative justice, yeah. if you will, which yeah. is which is what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, let's, like, everybody put down your weapons. Yeah. You know, I mean, Pomo had no. The I, there were so many people here, and war didn't exist here. We're gonna have to talk. Fair, about, yeah. We're gonna talk. You know, as the series goes yeah. on, we're gonna go over so many themes, including like war between people be, the war on nature mm -hmm. you know the, the, the you know we hear about this this word the interface you know bring it back to fire a little bit the interface of the urban and wildland there is a war going on there of ideas that's related to justice that's related to identity written on the landscape and in people's yeah. bodies right now people are dying for that war in yeah. that war right now yeah and, and unpacking that's going to take some time. I'm so pleased to have hours with you here. Um, you know, well, Obi, every time I talk to you, it's like uh, um, I forget. You know, I always forget about so many things. I forget about stories. And I, a lot of the stories sit, I guess, like seeds in a sack in the back of my head. <laughs> and, you know, you come here and it's like you're throwing water at me. And all those seeds are the the paper sack in the side of my head is breaking apart and the seeds are coming out and the sprouts are going all over and I go away thinking uh, every time I talk to you Ovi I walk away thinking just as I did often when I teach a class or give a lecture and I'm sure you experience this I walk away and I think I should have said this I should have said oh I forgot to say this I meant to say this and you know what's wonderful about this series is um, if I can remember by the next time or when the other episodes come um, <laughs> I'll I'll say I'll have another chance to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remind you. Uh, yes, I'll remind you will. You. I yeah. have I have full faith in you, Obi. <laughs> oh, it, it feels like we're winding down right now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we haven't even we haven't even discussed grizzly bears. You know, we haven't even discussed uh, all the ways that fire uh, manifests in our lives through yeah. through through fires everywhere. I mean, uh, I learned recently that uh, that uh, the word domesticate comes from Latin domos, which is which is hearth. Like the taming of fire is what where the word domestication comes from. I I, did, I wasn't aware of that, um, but you know I've always thought fire is you know I'm saying the obvious as I've probably said too many obvious things this last hour, but um, the obvious thing is as fire was the first thing as far as we know if we want to think in these terms, but fire was the first thing that gave us kind of power and made other things uh, in nature afraid of us. Mm -hmm. Remember, we don't have big claws. We don't mm -hmm. have, our teeth aren't that big or good. We can't run that fast, right. but we can certainly have fire well, we to intimidate fire. things yeah. and chase things away. And of course, creation uh, provided fire in the form of lightning and fires for us. And we learned, of course, how to make fire. But fire became power for us. And the question is, what do we do with it? And just to be real reductionist here, controlled burning, which we learned to do, which shaped the environment That's right. as the Europeans found it, let's say, when they came here, fire was integral to the landscape that was here and the life that was here. Mm -hmm. And it was used by the indigenous people to shape that life, enhance that life, and ensure the continuance of that life. That's right. 
Now, it can also be used um, against us. Maybe fire and nature is all very mad, and maybe the trees and everybody are getting together and saying, you know, it's time that they get punished. They've been misusing us and all of that. Um, but, you know, you quit using fire or seeing its advantages in a landscape and you get into trouble. Remember, the first law that the Spanish passed, well, the two laws that the Spanish passed against us, the first right. one was they forbid control our burning mm. because they read that as we were burning the landscape so their cattle and horses and goats, sheep couldn't eat. When in fact, we'd been doing something we'd been doing for thousands upon thousands of years. But again, mm. yeah, cultural blindness. I think blindness. that was predic predicated, and I think fire suppression continues to be predicated on a subtext of racial violence towards tribal people. Well, and the whole notion of ownership. It's my property. I can do what I want. I don't have to pay attention to the laws of nature. Ooh, or, But going back okay, to, nat okay. to Native people also, um, remember the whole notion about California Indians. The justification well into the 20th century, even perhaps today, was, well, they weren't doing anything with the land. They weren't using it to make money. They were just sitting there. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm going to own land, and um, I don't know how to take care of it, but it's mine. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So what's, what's, what's clearly developing between us now is the beginnings of a much broader conversation of fire. And I said again, like, we have... We have Three more months of this stuff, uh, uh, this stuff being inside, like like firmly inside, like fire, the fire season here, right? Which is which has always felt to me like what summer should be called in California, yeah. fire season. Uh, but summer you know, and fall, it's like six months. Now. It's like six months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. It's yeah. true. And uh, uh, this discussion is going to go on. We're going to do this podcast. I think every first Thursday. You tell me, month. Obi. I'll be here. That's good. <laughs> I'll just be sitting here on your mountain. Sitting on my mountain. I'm waiting for Obi to come and get those seeds going. I'll get the seeds going. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Do a little, own little yes. uh, you know, yeah. prescriptive burn. Yes. Um, and so, so we're going to continue talking about fire next time. Today was a discussion of um, the consciousness of fire, if you will. Yeah. You know, and next time I'd like to discuss how you can't talk about fire without talking about water. For example, uh, the fire regime across California is as altered as the water regime across California, the waterscape. Uh, and uh, the two are inseparably linked. And there's a lot of biotic factors that are leading to the epidemic of fire, of bad fire, as, as we could say, we talk about good fire versus bad fire. We talk about the character of fire on the land. We talk about it, how it exists inside of this clock, inside of this space, inside of this horizon across California. This is, this is, a, this is a very long conversation to have. And I think, you know, just, just to sort of like... Can I do a teaser for the next section? Right, I guess, I, guess, I, I guess so. I guess, I guess I'm just like thinking like... Who knows what's going to happen in the next 30 days? Yes. We could have some big blow-ups, you know. We might, got, you know, great spirit, whatever, the earth forbid, that we won't be able to sit here. That's another thing we have to think about. If it could be burned. Uh, right. but it, but this, let, this isn't very much grass you have here. Well, is... yeah, but around they haven't taken care of it the way mm. I have here. Mm. But let me just say a teaser here about you're absolutely right about fire and water. You really got me thinking here. Remember... Water was integral. All the villages here, and there were more than anywhere else, were located around bodies of water. And the health of the water from the mountain streams to the laguna was always indicative of the political health of the people. Mm. I don't think that's a truth that has changed. The people on the mountain had to keep the streams clean so things were clogged and the fish could move up. Yeah. If they didn't, they couldn't trade with the people in the Laguna. And if the Laguna people weren't taking care of the water and the water potatoes, they couldn't trade with the people here. Yeah. If there was tension, people would mess with the water. Mm. And mm. my goodness, look, 
Look, mm. talk about tension in the world today. What you were just describing, this idea of like a, a cascade, cascading yeah. feedback, uh, a, a cascading series of events. One thing leads to another. It's going to be really fun to to explore with you, like you know, how like salmon populations are related to butterfly diversity. You know, like uh, you know, you could to redwoods. Make, yeah, you could extrapolate yeah. forest health in general. You know, uh, uh, we could we can talk about. Um, the the ways in which um, climate breakdown by way of anthropogenic global warming is affecting the water cycle across the planet now it's and across california specifically we're at the edge of everything here um california the only way to upscale from california would be to talk about the whole world the whole the whole biosphere you know what i like to say obi hmm. find me one thing that's not connected to the rest and i'll give you my house <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep my house. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> That's pretty great. Okay, so I guess we're going to be signing off. Stuff Are we signing off? Yes, yeah, good. I, th I think so. Many more things I want to talk about, but we're going to have a chance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Obi. We actually have a couple questions. Um, oh, while you we guys got questions. About questions. Questions. I forgot. I forgot. I, are well, there any <laughs> answers? That's what we we need answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while, you, while you guys are talking about fire, um, River Moon wants to know if you have anything to say about the McKinney fire or if you can speak to it. Oh, yeah. I was talking about. Um, we we like, both have. I have friends, too. I have friends yeah. nearby up there. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, again, uh, well, I'll just be really. Ba I'm, uh, um, I'm sure Obi will have uh, something more to say. But um, again, I think that that's happening. Be <laughs> Remember. Obi, I said understudy, uh, and I meant understory. And Obi said, "You've been in the theater too long, Greg." Um, <laughs> the, but the uh, built up understory, uh, the yeah, built up the, understudy, the, the, uh, understudy. Yes, <laughs> I, I said that to Obi. But I think again, the lack, of, the ways in which the, the fire there was not uh, the the landscape there has not been managed for so long. Um, is is is. Uh, and the drought, all of these things are becoming a confluence of disasters that we are living in the midst of and will not be able to escape until we begin rethinking and taking care of and being responsible for where we are as much as possible. I think, I think it's a relationship to fire. I think there's yeah. paradoxes there as well that we need to navigate very carefully. The idea that that across Northern California despite the great conflagrations of the past several years. You remember there was there, yeah. was there was a 90 days in 2020 that more land burned in Northern California than did in the past 90 years. Yes. Uh, here we are in 2022. Uh, we are off to a start uh, uh, with, with the McKinley Fire being the biggest fire by acreage so far this year. Um, uh, and so early. Uh, uh, well, it's August. It's about time for some big fires. August is... <laughs> it's time. Uh, yikes. It will, yeah. Well, you see, yeah. what I mean is, like, we don't need less fire. We yeah. need more fire. Across the f Northern California, there, the land is entirely fire deficient yeah. inside of its return interval. Uh, it's regular, it's naturalized return interval over the past several thousand years. Uh, so, uh, you know, in pre-contact times, we were talking about six to ten million acres a year burned. And this is this is low severity, high intensity fire. I mean, look at a pile of pine duff. Yeah, that stuff is made to burn. Yeah, that's. Fire is so complete with inside the language of California ecology, arboreal ecology, that I would go so far as to call trees are made of fire waiting to burn. Well, I, I would some remember we wanted to keep the bigger ones by keeping the understory. Oh, controlled. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Fire takes away the small and leaves the big as opposed to logging which takes away the and big at the and same the time small. if you know you have a good relationship with fire where you take care of fire and use it to help take care of you and everything else it's good otherwise fire will turn on you which is what it's doing 
it's become out of control. And it's all connected. It works both ways. I mean, if you're not taking care of the landscape and using fire to take care of the landscape and being responsible That's right. with that thing, it's going to turn on you. And it, it, look what's happening. That's right. That's right. Well, inside of this, this homeostasis that develops across old forests, mm-hmm. our forests are young. Oh, yeah. And a young forest does not have the quality of relationships that uh, an old forest does. And also, as the young forest was growing, all that understory was growing simultaneously with mm. no management. Mm. Mm. Remember, the trees were huge when there was all that burning mm-hmm. in pre-contact times. Mm-hmm. 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 So. And then you just get a little uptick of temperature, a little uptick of aridity across a global climate pattern. Of and what you get is... Less a, water. Of less water. That's right. Yeah. Less water inside of the atmosphere. I'm talking about atmospheric water, let alone yeah. a, a lessening, a, dip, uh, a lowering of the, of the water table in the, in, of, of the underground reservoir. Uh, but inside of the atmosphere, the uptick of aridity means that you have a lowering of the vapor deficit within the wood body of the tree itself. So the trees themselves are becoming more susceptible and less able. And then you add things like fragmentation, simplification, in, in, infirmity, yeah. right? Uh, uh, infestation by, by um, uh, uh, native beetles. Who are, you see this across the Well, they're, they're just like the southern, us. As, southern, things, southern, as these things change, we life. too yeah. become more vulnerable to viruses. Mm. You know, it's simultaneous. I mean, look at these trees. These are very old trees, but they're very dry. And I worry Mm. about the the older trees, just like older people are more vulnerable. That's right. When this sort of thing happens. So, um, well, I think I think of the Pacific. I I think of Northwest California. Remember, this is a conifer hotspot, right? In uh, in diversity, there's more species of different kinds of firs, cedars, pines, spruces than there is anywhere on the planet Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and what we're frightened of in the ecological community is within the next 50 to 100 years we might be saying goodbye to uh, many uh, many endemic species meaning they only occur in like particular watersheds near uh, that are tributaries to the Klamath River, you know, thinking like the Brewer Spruce, for example, um, w- which might be extinct in, in the next 70 years. Mm. So the idea is like when, we, when we're combating climate breakdown, we're saving the trees in that regard. We're saving the old forests that are still there. There's different strategies. Do we move that? Brewer spruce cones, for example, there's there's been some, um, this is called assisted migration, right? Because California trees have done this before, but it's happening so rapidly that they can't retreat run, run northward, away fast enough. northward and upslope, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> which, is what, which is what the yeah. trees want to do. Yeah. So do we put, do we take them to valleys in Canada, say, that, that will resemble, um, except, except for the wide-ranging males. That, yeah. Can only do that for a little so while. long, yeah. For for so yeah. long, uh, but but we will we will talk about the cascade feedback examples, the cascading effects of having apex predators in your ecosystem, mm-hmm. towards the biodiverse biodiverse benefit of all species, um, and uh, uh, you know, as as we move forward into like one of the great policy prescriptions that I am an advocate of at this point, of course, is the wildlife uh, bridges that we're building across California. Uh, the big one is the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Connective Bridge down there over 101 near Thousand Oaks, which by itself, by this one piece of connective infrastructure, is um, will save the southern population of, of California mountain lions between from, uh, save them from genetic isolation yeah. uh, between the, the, the Simi Hills to the north and the, and the Santa Monica uh, uh, 
mountains to the south mm -hmm. and what that will also do is because we're learning that wildlife bridges work this is yeah. going to be the largest wildlife bridge in the world it spans 10 lanes of, of traffic it's just e enormous it costs 100 million dollars it's a huge project and now apparently legislation is on the table in sacramento that will uh, necessarily tie every new road build to uh, 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 couple any new road bill with engineered built-in wildlife corridor mitigation as well. You have to have wildlife bridges or culverts work too. But the thing is, they work. The forest talks to itself. The ecosystem talks to itself. Everybody uses, they know where the bridges are. It's not like, oh, there's, there's a bridge. We can use it. It's like, it's like the whole ecosystem benefits. It's not just mountain lions. It's population of butterflies mm -hmm. it's population of spiders it's population of bats these the even even avian creatures the creatures you don't think like benefit from from wildlife bridges we're finding the evidence for such pieces of infrastructure going there's forward. your crows coming oh there's my crows you're coming. talking about wolves right 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 so this this quickly so i'm just i'm just talking about the the hardscape interplay between uh, humans and predators and a path forward out of the old industrialized, the industrial fundamentalist paradigm of wolf bad, predator bad, predator competition, predator, you know, must be killed. The eradication, which is, which is, uh, which denies aspects of the more than human world that are necessarily intrinsic to the language of that world, fire included as well. Predation and fire. How about that? Jerry, we got any more questions? This is fun. <laughs> no, that, that, about does it. that it about does it. So a anyway, um, you can find us. We're going to have an email, I think, at uh, placeandpurpose.live. So, so, oh, great. So, I, so, you're, 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 so if you think of questions, you can get to us. We're, we're starting up an Instagram account to place and purpose that's a good place to find us i hang out more there than like twitter we'll give you all the answers in the world we'll tell you what we'll it's give like you all to, the questions. what it's like but we'll tell you what indians think of nature and all other things. <laughs> <laughs> this guy thinks of nature oh geez yeah. uh, well thank you my friend thank you obi this was great and thank you for all you fo folks listening um indeed it, it's important important to have these conversations and just to think and ponder the bigger world of which we're a part. Yeah. Place and purpose. We're only getting started. Nice. We're only getting started. All righty. Thank you. Too. Take care. Bye-bye.